The Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. Now, optimism is a massively attractive trait in absolutely everyone. Pessimism is less attractive. What is the difference between pessimism and optimism? I think everybody is right to be apprehensive about the future. The big difference between a pessimist and an optimist when it comes to considering the future is that the optimist regards the future as being better than the past or certainly better than the present. And if they are fearful that it might not be, they act to ensure that it will be. So if you are a pessimist, you are less likely to act. It's a great quote from Pete Mouton. I quoted him in my first book, The Upside of Down. Negative people never build anything. And if you think of pessimists around you, I wonder whether or not people with a more pessimistic mindset are poorer than those with a more optimistic mindset. Poorer in happiness, in health, and certainly in money. Warren Ingram from Galileo Capital. Would you concur? A hundred percent, Bruce. I mean, I think the, 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 to be kind to the pessimists, the, the, they're also probably least likely to be completely poor. Uh, so so they, they are so prepared for a rainy day, which they are a hundred percent convinced is going to come, that uh, that to, to, to give them their due, they're, they're probably Fair not the, 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 those that just spend as if there is no tomorrow. But but that's the one. That's the one positive. The negative is that uh, they find it incredibly hard to to see an upside to the future, and uh, there are valuable people to have in a business so that they help prepare you for 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 any you know pot- potential negative uh, issues. But uh, but but they're awful in the investment environment if they're the dominant kind of character trait of of, of an investment person or or an investment team. And, and certainly if you're listening to this and, and you're a pessimist, you know, I know exactly what you're saying. You're saying to yourself, they don't know what they're talking about. Tomorrow is going to be really bad. But, uh, but, but for the, those of us who are optimists, uh, you know, we, we look at tomorrow and we go, it's possible that it could be bad. I mean, that, that's a fairly realistic view, but, but it's equally possible that, that, that the sun's going to rise, that businesses will do a bit more than they did the day before. And some businesses are going to just change the world. And, and they're the ones that are going to change an investment portfolio. And those are the things we need to be chasing. And I don't think an, uh, an optimist is somebody who looks at tomorrow and says, oh, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome because that means you need to go and see somebody who generally wears a white coat to work, who they can take your temperature. Um, because not every day is going to be perfect. But optimists tend to believe that they can influence the future to the advantage of society, the advantage of themselves, their own families, perhaps. And, uh, you know, I think if you're more of a pessimistic nature, yes, you may put money away for a rainy day, but I wonder how that affects your risk appetite. Because I think when it comes to investing and your hypothesis that we're not optimistic enough means you make different kinds of savings and investment choices depending on your mindset. Absolutely. So, so let me give you some some interesting examples. And, and it's actually, I mean, one one would be a South African share, and we, we've spoken about it on this show for for at least a decade. Um, and, and that would be Naspers. And, and I'm and I'm conscious of of talking about Naspers at a time where the share price is is down probably half. Uh, but but consider where it came from. Consider what it was, you know, two or three decades ago, and and consider. Uh, how, how that that share has has grown, how you know the investments that it's made, and and what those underlying investments have done right around the world, uh, and, and I would say, almost nobody sat, sat on the outside of that business looking at it and sa- and said to themselves, "Gee, this thing's going to you know going to kind of create the wealth that it has created." Uh, I would argue, you know, equally around uh, Amazon or Apple in in, in the states. And and certainly I, I would be one of those people that I, I don't think I, I think I lack the imagination, frankly, to, to look at a business like Amazon and say, you know, that it, it you know a little bookseller could, could suddenly you know not suddenly but but over time become a business that could that, that could change the way that business is done and and become this absolute cash generation engine. Uh, and, and I think it's you know part of it's psychological because human beings can't think. Uh, they, they talk about geometric maths. You know, we, we can't think geometrically. In other words, we can't think about something that that doubles every you know every day or every month, uh, and and then see what that will do in the future. We we tend to think in, you know, in a linear way. In other words, 
we would say, well, if I've got a grain of rice today, you know, maybe I'll have like a grain in a quarter tomorrow and, and, and a grain in two quarters the day after. And, and so we go and what, one little step after the other. But, but you know, the, the, the optimists see, see the world rather differently. And, and you know, you think about a, a guy like Elon Musk, and, and, and I'm not sure that every single screw is absolutely tightened in his head. He must have a few loose. But the point is, he, he looked at the world and said, I, c- I can change the world. And, and he's done it. You know, um, um, Steve Jobs, sim- similarly, with different reasons. The, the same with Bill Gates wanting to put a computer on everyone's desk. All of those have one theme. They, they have been fabulous for investors. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, even someone like Warren Buffett, who, who's certainly, you know, you, no one would accuse him of being Pollyanna, you know, l- looking at the world and saying it's, you know, it's brilliant all the time. But he certainly looks at the world and goes, there are enormous opportunities here. And, and I think we're in a stage like that now where, the, the level of pessimism is rising, you know, and, and uh, correctly and understandably, th- there are a lot of reasons to be worried about the world. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons to be worried about our country. But but just one thing really fascinates me is when you retire and and you you put a portfolio together and you say I'm going to put sixty percent in shares, forty percent in bonds, and I'm going to draw four percent a year from that portfolio for the rest of my life. If you do that, you are likely to have four times more money by the end of your life, let's say it's 30 years down the road, than you are to have less money than when you started. It's but, just but explain, I know okay, just, from, just, just repeat that again, please, because that's a really important thing, and I want you to explain how it works. So so, so you, you, let's say you, you retire and you've got, uh, you, you're, you're fortunate in the position of, of having, let's say, 10 million rand. And, and you take that 10 million rand and you allocate 6 million rand to the stock market. And, and you know, the, it's both the SA and the world stock market. Uh, and you do nothing special with it. You just buy, you know, buy the, buy the world index, the, the stock market index. And, and then you take uh, the, the 4 million rand and you put it in the world uh, bond index. So, so nothing, nothing special. Uh, and you leave that money to grow every single year. But uh, you know, during the year, you draw four percent of, of the value of that of that portfolio um, every year as a, as an income. So so you just say, well, that's what I'm going to live off, uh, and I'm going to leave the balance of the money to stay invested and to keep growing. If you do that every single year and you leave the money, no matter what's going on around you, no matter what people like me are saying about you know things are getting scary now and be careful and all of those things, you just stay invested and you you keep drawing your four percent of your portfolio year after year after year, uh, irrespective of what's going on around you. The likelihood is you, 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 30 years down the line, you've got four times more money than when you started. Four times more money. What is the growth rate assumption in there? Is it like a 10% average growth rate? And so you are, you, you're you growing at a faster rate than you're drawing down on, on your capital because that is what then leads to the growth in the portfolio, despite the fact that you are drawing down on that portfolio each and every single year. Exactly right, Bruce. So, so you would you, you would get uh, in, you know a, a growth rate of let, let's say to be conservative somewhere around you know eight to ten percent a year. You're drawing four uh, percent, and and you leave the balance behind uh, to to continue growing. That that the the growth that stays in there is important because it's 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 helping to protect your the buying power of your money, so it continues to grow. Um, and, and protect you against inflation as well. So, so next year, when you when you draw from your portfolio, you, you don't have 10 million anymore. You've got more than 10 million. And so the, the 4% that you're drawing has also increased. Yes. And it won't w- work in a perfectly straight line every single year. Some years it might go, go down even, you know, and, but, but there'll be other years where, where it will go up a heck of a lot more than 10%. But over a long period of time, the 10% number is a fairly good, fairly reasonable projection up probably a bit conservative, but that's okay. And and over, over a lifetime, you look back and you go, I, I, I've left behind a heck of a lot of money. Uh, and, and the reality I is that- I should have spent minded, 10% a year and spend it all, uh, what does it go? I should have gone on ski holidays, spend kids' inheritance or whatever the case. Yeah, is. And, and maybe not being uh, so, so conservative and so pessimistic, but I think we're there now. I think we're in a stage where people are just- uh, a bit too worried and and looking at the future and saying it's going to be worse and and even the optimistic people I, I find myself in that uh, um, in, you know that category at the moment of just looking at things and going gee there's a lot to be worried about and that's true there is a lot to be worried about but that doesn't mean that uh, that that we're not setting the, the the scene for for the next big spurt of growth I don't know where it'll come from but but they always come. 
But you have to be insane not to be worried about the future. Because if you're not worried about the future, you're not making sensible choices and decisions about the future. You've got to be, know what the risks are so that you can make smarter choices. Um, you're not ignoring the risk. That's not what an optimist does. An optimist says, I see the risk. And this is how I'm going to act to mitigate that risk. And, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing, and I think you, you know you've spent a lot of time with with some of these optimists that have you know that that have built fabulous businesses in terrible times, uh, and and you know listening to you talk about them, reading the books, it's always interesting that they're not oblivious to what's going on around them, but but they they look at it and they go, oh, I can see a gap there, I can see an opportunity, yeah. I can see something that other people can't see because all they can see is disaster and doom and gloom. And I can see the ray of light and I'm going to follow that ray of light and build something beautiful. Uh, and, and that's the message from my perspective is I just think, yeah. you know, even if you're not going to build something beautiful as a business, just be careful with your investments that you don't become so borne down by, by negativity and everyone else being pessimistic. You know, they're not the ones that are going to change the world. It's the optimists. And those are the ones you should be following. <laughs> Exactly right. Question, and this is from Lerato, and Lerato says, I have some cash available. Oh, that's nice, Lerato. I would like to put it to good use. Excellent, Lerato. I am thinking of doing some renovations on my property. I think this will be an investment because the value of the property may increase. Good word there, Lerato. Uh, my only concern is that I don't want to spend too much on the renovations. How do I determine how much I should put into my property is it a good idea to put money into the property or should I just add it to my investments? Good question, Warren. Where I mean, there was a time where you were vehemently opposed um, to anybody ever owning the roof over their head. You said, rent, rent, rent. You can rent much better for less than it costs and you don't have the headaches and stuff. Uh, and then you did buy property and um, you may still regret it. But um, I, I'm curious as to where you stand on the renovation versus investment debate. Um, I, I think that, that, you know, if you are an owner of a property, uh, renovating, if you're doing it sensibly, uh, and, and I'll explain what that means now, but, but it can be a, ve a very good idea. Um, and I think you just got to you've got to allocate that money to the right places in the house, uh, frankly, and and be be careful of of ego and 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 overspending on a property. They, they always talk about overcapitalizing. So, uh, you, you know, if you're if you've got a a place that you've bought and let's say the the bathrooms and the kitchens are really old, really tatty, uh, it's it's been proven time and again that that upgrading the bathrooms and the kitchen uh, certainly makes sense because you know that's what people look at that, that's what home buyers will will focus on uh, and is one of the first things they look at when they decide to to buy the property or not and and it will add value but but for example if you live in an apartment in a you know in a in a an apartment complex or a townhouse or something like that where everyone's in, you know got got exactly the same size property and and everything looks the same they all painted the same on the outside be very careful that you don't suddenly have the most expensive kitchen and the most expensive bathroom, you know, in, in the entire place where, where you, you com completely outshine everyone else. But actually any buyer who walks in, looks at that and goes, gee, it's incredible. But, you know, for, for half the price, I can buy the place next door and, and put in, you know, kitchens and or bathrooms in the kitchen that, that, that will look almost as good, but, but much cheaper. So, so I think renovation makes sense, but but just be careful that you that you don't overcapitalize on the property. If it's a freestanding house, again, you know, you know, for, for example, putting in the world's biggest swimming pool and you know, and big big water features, etc. Uh, you know, it might be nice. It might might make you feel good about the place, but just know that a buyer is not going to look at that necessarily and give you a lot more money for it just because you've done that. So, so I think it's about you know m make sure the place is well maintained. But but if I'm renovating, I'm doing very simple stuff. Before I do anything, what I am certainly going to do is get two or three different estate agents to walk through that property with me and say, what would you do if there were simple things to change? And it's it's fascinating. You know, the good estate agents with experience will tell you, look, if you knock this wall down, you create an open plan space, and you know, and and certainly this bathroom needs to be changed. But don't worry about the rest. You know, but by the third agent, you've got a fairly good idea of, of what to listen to and what to ignore, uh, and then you go for it. But but your, your first comment is right, Bruce. I, I tend to be a happy renter and rather rather than an unhappy owner. Yeah, and owning property is expensive, Lerato, and you've got to be really careful of what you do because the moment you you, up, you upgrade the kitchens and the bathrooms, and you go, jeez, oh, the rest of the house looks tatty. 
So then you start, you know what, all I'm going to do is I'm going to you know, paint the walls and I'm going to replace the carpets. And you do that. But actually, it's still a bit dark and dingy. Wouldn't it be nice if we just took out that wall over there? So you then take out that wall over there and suddenly, oh, actually, it needs sliding doors. You know what we need? We need to open up the aspect of this house. <laughs> we need to get a, a, we need to let some light in because this is such a beautiful, bright home. But we need some warmth in winter. So when the sun is low on the horizon, we get that lovely northern sunlight coming in. And before you know it, Clara. Um, you, you know, you, you've gone down the, a very, very slippery slope. Um, and also that idea of, um, in particularly in townhouse complexes where everything is the same, the way property pricing works is that estate agents go and look at the average of the last six months and go, well, the average price in this place is 1.2 million. Now, you may have spent an extra 200,000 rand on your property, but the average sale is 1.2 million. And estate agents will say, well, yeah, that's very nice. We can get you 1.25. And you go, but I've spent, yeah, you know, I've spent one two, and then I've spent another two hundred. It's worth one point four. No, it's not, because the going price for the units in this uh, complex is one point two. Yes, you've made improvements, so we can get you one point two five. But you're going to pay to me anyway, and <laughs> in in um, in estate agents' fees. Um, so yeah, be very very careful, Lerato. And it's you know, overcapitalizing is is a is a terrible thing to do. It really is. So, so, so I just can't help myself. It sounds like there's some painful experience in there somewhere. I tell you what, if I showed you <laughs> the scars, Warren, the scars! <laughs> and you've also got to be prepared, Lerato. You know, again, there are people who, you know, have a, a bucky builder on call who can come in and do a decent job and people flip houses. And that's fine. I mean, there's the, I, I don't know if it works anymore, but there, you know, in, in times where interest rates are low and money is plentiful and there is growth in the property market, you can start, you can do that. You can flip houses. You can, you can make a, a, a turn on a house um, as, as you do it. And it's some way, it is one way that people build wealth. But unless, if, you, if this is going to be your home and you're going to live in it, it's got to be wonderful. You've got to love going home. You've got to think it's a, a great place to be. You don't want to be unhappy in your home. But at the same time, if a year after your renovations, you, you move on, my goodness me, you're going to lose money. And I think that is a, a proven concept as well, Warren. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, if you, if you are going to move on in anything, you know, kind of fr from the, let, let's say, you know, six months to three year period, then truthfully, give it a lick of paint, uh, you know, clean the carpets if you've got carpets and, and do nothing else. Uh, you, you know, re renovating a house is a you know painful exercise at the best of times, and and as you say, fraught with fraught with a whole lot of r risks in terms of uh, builders and contractors and the like. So so it's something that you do um, w w with the view that it's going to it's going to make your life better in the house, and and secondly that if it does uh, lead to a, um, appreciation in the price, it's going to do it over a five or eight or ten year period. But but certainly it's not going to take your your property from one point two to one point eight million rand in a year because you you know you, you changed the bathroom and uh, the bathrooms in the kitchen. There's there's no chance that happens. Yeah, and just be very careful. Just oh, it's a hundred rand a square meter for those tiles, but those tiles are one hundred and twenty five. And then those taps <laughs> are only are 2,000, but those taps, are, and we only need six taps. So if we get the, the 3,000 rand taps, that's so much better. And that soap dish is so much nicer than that one. And you can smuggle yourself <laughs> out of money so fast. And you can be smuggled out of money. Lerato, don't do it. Um, anyway, hope you're happy in your, in your renovated home, Lerato. Um, dividend withholding tax, what is it? So dividend withholdings tax, uh, we, we if we own shares in companies that that pay us dividends as as shareholders, and that that could be via the JSE or you know exchange traded fund etc. Th those dividends don't attract income tax. You know normally things like rent and and salaries and those kinds of things will attract income tax. So so it feels like the dividends that we get paid from these investments are free of tax, but that's not quite true because what happens is before the company that's paying you the dividend actually pays it out, they've already deducted 20% of the value of that dividend and they've given it to our friends at SARS in, in the form of this dividend withholdings tax. So, so it's not a tax that you need to declare in your tax returns and it, it certainly won't in, increase your normal income tax rate. So, so for most people, it just feels like it's a tax-free uh, deal, but actually what's happened is they've, they've already paid away 20% 
courtesy of the company who's obliged to do it. Um, and, and so that that's in, in simple form what, what a dividend withholding tax is. Uh, I, I have an opinion on it, which is I think it's a terrible form of tax, but but, but that's I guess a different conversation. But but for anybody in the in the in the stock market uh, world, you you are paying this tax already. You just probably don't know about it. And even owners of private companies, uh, when they want to pay themselves a profit, you know the company pays income tax itself. They, then when they decide to declare a dividend, the, that that dividend's tax is is paid to SARS, and then you get the balance of the dividend. So so. Yeah, a fairly tax efficient way of, of, of earning an income, but, but certainly not tax free. No, it's not. And, you know, again, it's a nice problem to have, but it is typical of the way in which developmental states work. I mean, it is the ultimate wealth tax. If you're getting paid a dividend, it's because you're earning money from an investment or from a business that you own. It's a, it's a great way to extract money from people who are paying that other taxes anyway. It's a it's it's politically a cheap tax to 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 impose. I think economically it's enormously destructive. I, I just you know if we're saying to 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 this country that we want businesses to grow, we want businesses to employ people, th- then what we need to do is encourage uh, people to put money into businesses. We need to encourage the flow of money from bank accounts and from kind of you know expenditure to actually investment. And if you want people to to do that, and you want in, in, in pension funds and the like to do that as well. You know, then you've got to do everything you can to encourage that, and that means saying to entrepreneurs, you know, we keep hearing that small business is a huge focus for for, for government, and 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 so you know, a, a dividend withholdings tax is the exact opposite of encouraging small business to grow, because shareholders who take all the risk of building a small business and employing people and all of the st- things that government want us to do, uh, we we are being penalised for doing that through through this tax over and above the income taxes that we pay and the VAT and all the other uh, mil- millions of taxes we pay, both explicit and implicit. So if it, if I could put a wish through to 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 the government would be to say scrap this. It's a it would be a huge sign of, of confidence and 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 growth in, in in businesses of all shapes and forms. And it's certainly not just a wealth tax. You know, it's not just rich people doing this. This these are people trying to kind of make a living and trying to employ a few people and trying to get by and, and make a difference to the country. Good luck with that one, Warren. I'm not going to be holding my breath because I'll end up passing out before that message is heard. Warren Ingram, Galileo Capital. Have a good long weekend. Thank you, Warren.